That's probably the best blocking versus splining explanation I've ever seen. I wanted to see if AI could answer your specific animation questions, the ones about workflow, your career, the specific hurdles on your shot. But the thing is, I didn't want to do it the normal way. I didn't want to just punch in a prompt and it searches the internet, and scrapes data from who knows where, and gives you answers that are kind of whatever. I wanted to do it specifically by having AI look only at my YouTube channel and pull the answers from stuff I've shared previously on my videos, which is why I'm going to be using NVIDIA's Chat with RTX. It is a free tech demo that you can download and you can feed it your own sources of stuff or you can use YouTube videos and it'll pull the transcripts from those YouTube videos as its data set. One of the coolest parts of this is nothing you use for the AI goes anywhere. It's all locally run on your computer. It runs off the GPU. I could give it a folder full of PDFs and documents and like notes that I have. Instead, I'm going to give it the entire YouTube playlist of my channel. And it's going to download the auto-generated captions for all of my videos and use that to answer the questions that we give it. The fun part is, I did this live, and I didn't tell anybody what I was doing. What's your best advice on handling lip sync animation? My big thing is to focus on the f what I call the four components of language for animation. The corners of the mouth, in and out, the up and down of the jaw, the tongue, and the lip shape. Animation related questions. Generally, how does one get better at animation? First thing is to develop, develop your eye. You know, watch movies and TV shows and, and absorb everything you can from the stuff that you are inspired by. You might also learn some new techniques and styles if you try to kind of replicate that just for your own practice, not for demo reels. Find the clips you like, frame through them, analyze, observe. You need to make sure you take time away from every shot or every project you do so you can look at it, take a breather, come back and look with fresh eyes. That way you can actually judge your work appropriately. Uh, what are good ways to get into the industry, specifically get into big studios like Pixar and DreamWorks? The, uh, the first thing is just to get a job in the industry, whether it's at a big studio like Pixar, DreamWorks or a similar studio, but there's a lot of opportunities in the industry beyond just the major studios, so you should be open to different options. Are your intro classes scaled to everyone's level? Kind of. I mean, the, the essentials class is a beginner level class. The two week beginner crash course into Maya, the intro to body mechanics course that you can use Maya, Blender, or Unreal Engine for starts in April. So there are two classes enrolling right now, just like with my mentorship, four hours a week of stuff. It's all recorded. You get feedback, there's Discord channels, and you can use whatever tools you want. These are the ones that I support. And you can also see some of the work that people have done in my mentorship. What is the best way to animate a large scene? It depends, depends on the complexity of the scene, how much detail is required and the resources you've got and time and things like that. Before you even start, you'll have a clear plan and a concept of what it is you're actually hoping to make. Blocking, camera movements, character poses, other things like that. And so break down the scene into smaller manageable parts. What's the best way to approach an animation of dance choreography? I'm gonna say again, probably reference. You know, anything you record yourself or stuff you find online, to recreate the dance choreography in your tool. You can then, you know, base stuff off the reference, but add your own creative choices to make it more appealing than the actual reference was. And there are certain workflows that might make that easier as well. But in general, identifying key poses, anticipations, overshoots, and other things like that to make sure you're, you're getting all the depth of the reference. Well, how do you find the freelance world? Can I make a living of it as a fresher? Um, freelance world can be challenging. It can also be rewarding, but it may be difficult at the beginning to find clients and make a living from it. One of the most important things when starting out in freelancing is finding clients. Uh, also pricing. You have to consider, you know, figure out your budget. You have to consider your overhead costs, your rent, your bills, your other expenses, software costs, things like that. So when I ask it, what's the single most important thing to become an animator? Now this is an hour and a half long interview video I did with Simon Otto, the head of character animation on How to Train Your Dragon 1, 2, and 3. And I never asked that specific question, he never gave that specific answer, but it's taking what we talked about and molding the advice and the tips and the things that he said into an answer that contextually fits the question that we gave it. If you wanna ask a specific source, if you wanna ask me a question or some other YouTube creator or ask, you know, based on your own notes or things that you have yourself, you want a question answered from a specific place, you can just point it to that place if they've talked about it. I can also have it consolidate some of the tips that I might've given in a video if I'm trying to quickly remember what did I talk about in that piece of content I made three years ago and I'm trying to maybe update it. List five time management tips. Use a calendar to keep track of deadlines and appointments, break down large tasks into smaller manageable ones and keep a task list to help you stay on track. Prioritize tasks based on their urgency and importance. Set realistic goals and deadlines for yourself and take breaks to make time for self-care to avoid burnout. Those were all good tips. What animation books should I read? Yeah, look at that. It came from a gift ideas video I did in 2017. So I can use this as a content creator. You can use this if you're just trying to get your questions answered. And I did this whole thing as a live stream on YouTube and it 
went pretty well. There were some times I needed to correct it or maybe say something different because I didn't want to mislead anybody if it gave a bad answer. But the real problem point is my transcripts. It's what it's downloading from YouTube. I don't personally go through and actually check the captions that YouTube auto generates for my videos. So any specific animation terminology that I'm saying or I'm mumbling or I'm talking really fast and YouTube maybe doesn't transcribe it properly, that's gonna mess up the results and the answers to the questions. But for like 90% of the stuff, it actually worked surprisingly well. Blocking versus splining. The goal of blocking is to establish the timing, composition, and movement of the characters in the scene. Splining, on the other hand, is the process of refining the animation by adding more detail and smoothing out the movement. In summary, blocking is the initial stage with a rough version of the animation, and splining is the process of refining the animation by adding more detail and smoothing out the movement. That is an excellent summary, blocking versus splining, and the fact that we're getting a good answer from AI of what it is, is because it's just pulling from my videos. <laughs> It is coming from interviews with people who know what they're talking about. And this is one of several demos that I got to see NVIDIA put together at CES. NVIDIA Studio sponsored my trip out to Las Vegas in January to check out the different things they're doing with AI. Yeah. So it's gonna just replace just that blue sweater with exactly what I've just described. A black puffer vest <laughs> with a black and white knit sweater. I never would have known that that was data that was actually there, just not being displayed properly. You'll see you know, light reflecting off of the barrel or the top of it and it just really helps with the immersion. But they use it for video upscaling and for streaming and having different encoding things. If you're a streamer, you can do all kinds of stuff there. One of the things that's important to me is that these tools are being developed responsibly and ethically. And as far as I can tell, NVIDIA is doing a really good job of that. There were a bunch of different rooms of different demos I got to see when I was there. And a good example of what I'm talking about was Picasso. Picasso is a commercially safe generative AI tool, kind of in the same category of Photoshop or something like that. They partnered with Getty Images and you can generate stock media that you can use for stuff. But what I think is important about this is there's a lot of generative AI stuff out there. A lot of it just pulls art and data from places that you don't have the permission to actually pull that data from. And so artists are getting their stuff stolen. You can replicate the work of artists who didn't give their okay and they're not getting compensated for this type of thing. The only data they've trained on Picasso is stuff that Getty Images has specifically licensed to do that with. They have compensation figured out. They have all that licensing figured out. They're actually doing it properly because that's the only stuff you can actually generate. And a lot of their stuff is accelerated by the GPU. Things like this chat with RTX, it just runs locally on your graphics card. If anybody like wants to download chat with RTX, if you've got the graphics card for it, uh, you could literally do this right now if you wanted to. Imagine having my whole library of videos and other animators content that, you know, that you've watched or you've seen it or you have access to it. And it's like, there's a lot of information there. And you have questions like, if you don't have access to somebody to ask those questions to, this is pretty much the next best thing. One of the demos I thought was actually really cool was called Ace, Avatar Cloud Engine. It's like a character creator with AI. Hey Jin, can I get a bowl of miso ramen? One steaming bowl of miso ramen coming right up. What it is is it allows the NPCs in a game to have this large language model simulation happening in the background. So you'd walk up to an NPC in the game, you would use your microphone in real life, you'd talk into the microphone and you'd talk to the character. Your voice gets transcribed into text, which then gets fed into that character's AI prompt thing. It generates their response contextual to your question, their personality they've been coded with, and the world environment of the game. Their response comes back into like dialogue, audio file stuff, which then uses audio to face and the various tools to do the lip animation. And then they reply to you. So you talk to the NPC, they talk back, all this happens in the background and you end up with the ability to talk about anything because it can generate, you know, responses to anything. I don't know how to properly like describe to you how impactful and how like kind of jarring that experience was. Like to go see the demo, like to hear about it, it's like, oh, that's cool. To do it yourself, it's hard to describe how much of an impact it had on me as I realized like I don't have like four or five little like dialogue choices to choose from and these predetermined dialogue trees, I can talk to them about anything. I had to make small talk with an NPC and like, you steer the conversation as it like evolves and you can imply that like, hey, like the one time that you did this bad thing and they're like, well, hey, you deserved it. Like it was this whole thing. It's not gonna make sense for every game, but for game developers who want to use that and, and take that direction and make that a core part of the mechanics, we're gonna have some really interesting games coming out with this type of technology. It was really cool. I was, I'm very excited about it, honestly. And if you're interested in learning more about what NVIDIA is doing with AI and all these different tools and development stuff that they're doing, they have an entire conference called GTC, which is in San Jose in March, which is not to be confused with GDC in San Francisco in March. It's like GTC and GDC, 
both in the San Francisco Bay Area, both in March around the same time. I'll be at both. I'm going to be at GTC. And so if you want to check it out, even if you're not there, I'll have a link down below. You can get the, the free registration if you want to look more into this stuff. If you want to see the talks online, it's all free to register. But either way, thanks for watching. I'm Sir Wade, and I'll see you in the next video.